All right. So our panel is um, from capitalist realism to a solar punk reality, theorizing and building the infrastructures of a better future. Um, it's going to be with Joey Ayub, Luca Dowell, Ariel Karun, and me, Andre Rosario, uh, also known as Hydroponic Trash. Um, so Joey, you're up first, and I'll kick it over to you. Hey, yeah, thank you. So everyone can see the slides, correct? Um, okay. So, canceling the apocalypse. Um, I'm going to start this uh, presentation with a uh, character that uh, I don't think anyone here is a huge fan of. Uh, and I would be preaching to the choir by saying that I am not a huge fan of him either. But I'm going to start with Milton Friedman. And arguably, he is the, you know, we can make the argument at the least he's the most consequential economist of at least the latter half of last century, the 21st, 21st century. And in many ways, uh, to some extent, at the very least, to this day. In a recent piece, um, which he also turned into a podcast, Cory Doctor, an author um, I highly recommend for those who don't know, uh, he wrote the following. Milton Friedman was a monster, but he wasn't wrong about this. And I found this um, quite pertinent. It came out just a few weeks ago, as you can see, a month ago or so. And it was so related uh, to kind of the stock that I, I figured I'm going to start like that. So this is the quote and by Milton Friedman, and he wrote this in 72. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And here's the end quote. So I don't necessarily believe, agree, let's say that only a crisis produces real change. Of course, I think, uh, you know, again, being a solar punk person, this would, is not something that I would agree with. But the last bit, I think there's some truth to it, i.e. that we can be developing alternatives, even if in the moment as like when we're doing the work of developing it, when we're creating, you know, podcasts, artworks, uh, books, uh, articles, uh, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, in the moment, it might feel like it's not gonna, it may not make a huge amount of difference. But what we're kind of doing is building an infrastructure, a, so, a sort of a social infrastructure, a theoretical infrastructure that allows uh, lots of folks to to move beyond what what they consider to be quote unquote realistic. And this brings us to, or it brings me, sorry, to uh, what I wanted to say about this idea of uh, rea being realistic. Uh, checking again, that moved. Yeah, so. Unlike neoliberalism, which, you know, but in many ways is still the dominant uh, economic framework in our world today, in many ways also a political framework, uh, Solarpunk recognizes planetary limits. It is grounded in reality, uh, while at the same time recognizing that reality isn't enough. So what do I mean by this? I won't read the entire uh, quote that's here uh, because it's just too long. It's from a piece that I wrote um, a couple of years ago, I think, on Mangal Media. You can look it up if you want. Uh, solar upon climate change and the new thinkable uh, is, is the uh, title of the piece. So I'll just mention the, the, the first few sentences. Solar punk sits at the intersection of possible positive futures and likely negative ones. It is a recognition of humanity's wide ranging damage upon the natural world and inevitably upon itself. Solar punk is also a reaction to the cynical and dystopian imaginaries that have come out of the fear of climate change. It is a way of tackling eco anxieties and invitation to complement the important work of climate scientists. And then towards the end, I say, just as it is very easy for a child to imagine a zombie apocalypse due to the pop popular proliferation of such stories, solarpunks seek to, bet to build a world where children can imagine better futures and actively participate in making them true, or at least truer. So, next slide, yeah. My uh, kind of, if you want the central thesis of, of the argument, the argument that I'm making here is kind of a uh, straightforward one. Or a couple of them. One, neoliberalism is a story, right? It starts as a story that was then in many ways imposed uh, top down as we know. We know the story, I'm assuming this audience knows the story of like Thatcher and Reagan. And of course, Friedman is also associated with the Pinochet in Chile and many other regimes around the world that uh, it, like basically imposed a sort of privatization of everything to, 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 to put it mildly or to, to simplify it. So today's gloom, doom and gloom framework, which I do think is common, even if it's understandable, often complements Friedman's cynical worldview. And in many ways, I think complements neoliberalism rather than provide, rather than providing a concrete alternative to neoliberalism. Uh, 
And this is why I think we need Solarpunk. Uh, we have all in one way or another, I think, internalized what Mark Fisher called capitalist realism. And yeah, I should say, uh, Luca Dowell and I actually had a conversation on this topic and it was kind of a cross, um, what do they call these cross episode thingy? Like it was on my podcast and it was on, on their podcast as well. Uh, so what, capitalist realism, conceptualizing a different present and future requires the rejection of two of Thatcher's most infamous arguments. There is no alternative to capitalism. That's something that she said. And also there is no such thing as society. And I think those two are actually in, in some sense, very, very similar. At, at least they're inter, they're in, they in, interconnect. Uh, as I said, like the two ultimately complement one another. If there's no society, how do we tackle how? Yeah, sorry for the typo. How do we tackle global warming, which requires the collective? And if there's no alternative to capitalism, what's the point of trying anyway? The neoliberal economists have that have kind of dominated our world since the 70s and 80s have pulled off what was seen at the time as on or before that maybe as unimaginable. Uh, but as Freedom himself said, uh, the idea is to turn something that was, you know, in, uh, in unimaginable into something that that feels inevitable. And again, I'm not saying we should do exactly the way they did it, of course. I'm just saying that this is so this is something that we need to to make note of, if that makes sense. Uh, they did not do this like the neoliberals did not do this by appealing to facts alone. In fact, a lot of what they were saying we know now is simply factually untrue. For one, a, a fundamental um, flaw in the model is that they don't they cannot take into account the fact that the planet has finite resources uh, and i think that i would argue that the result of that of neoliberalism is an anti-human philosophy because humans in this framework are no longer social creatures but they are competitors and consumers they're no longer democratic actors and you know citizens and whatnot but would be sellers and buyers and that's basically what we're reduced to um, so not only do we know at the same time that like endless resource extractions is impossible and devastating, but we also know that this dominant economic paradigm tells us that the best we can do is to do minor adjustment to the system. So the best we can do essentially is to do some kind of minor adjustments to something that is fundamentally uh, impossible in the long term to be maintained. And also at the same time, even if we say it's going to end in 20 years or whatever, in the meantime, its effects are devastating. And of course, we know with global warming, that it's not even something we can really afford. Um, I'm going to actually skip a slide after just reading the first two here, just a matter of time. Neoliberalism is built on an inherent flaw, one which assumes that we have infinite resources, as we said. And we don't. We just do not. And so logic, logically, if you want to use the logic of supposedly what neoliberals say that they are using, logic would therefore command us to abandon it and implement instead a more planet friendly, for lack of a better term, economic system. So why aren't we? And I think, and actually it's something that Andrew said quite well in as part of his keynote speech, one reason is that the stories, uh, one reason is the stories we tell ourselves, stories that have been promoted for decades by state and private actors and internalize in virtually everything we do today. I think we all do it to some extent, and it's important to sort of recognize that in a way that, uh, so, so that we are better able to tackle it. And the, the equivalent of this, I, I don't remember who said this exactly, but it's almost like living in the USSR in like the 80s or whatever, and not knowing that the hegemonic ideology was called quote unquote communism. It's like living in the Soviet Union and not knowing terms like the Politburo or the party or not knowing names like Stalin or Gorbachev. And arguably, we can't, no parallels are per perfect, of course, but we do live in a world where we have a hegemonic ideology called neoliberalism, but for the most part, even their most, its most vocal proponents, don't use the actual term neoliberalism. They use stuff like, you know, the market or, you know, job growth, or they would use terms that most people maybe feel that they understand in one way or another, but they wouldn't call it by its name. And I think that there's a reason for that. Um, okay, so the last slide, I believe it's this one. Yep. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna end with a very um, amazing interview that I recommend everyone checking out. It's, uh, by, it's with Shokonishi, who's the author of the book, um, uh, Anarchist Modernity, you can see it on the screen, uh, and it was released a couple of years ago, uh, no, in 2020 on a website called asiaartworks.com, so feel free to look that up if you want. And there's something that he says in that interview that's very interesting, um, and here I'm just summarizing, again, I would recommend checking it out. He talks about a term called Anarchist Modernity, which I actually think has a lot to offer to Solarpunk and maybe can even be put in conversation with one another. Uh, at least that's something I would like to look to kind of explore. So he says, you shouldn't be afraid to do seemingly self-contradictory practices in this complex world. If you feel like you are locked in, but you feel no other way to survive in this world, 
do something outside of your quote unquote employee time that can be locked in by forces that you feel are outside your control. There are alternative times that belong to you where you can create and belong to another temporality and yet act in effective ways. And I feel like this kind of brings us uh, in the, to kind of what I st tried to argue for in the very beginning of this of this short presentation, which is that we don't belong to one temporality. We don't belong to the, the, the temporality of neoliberalism, for lack of a better term here. We belong to multiple temporalities where, you know, we're family members, we're friends, we have this job, we identify as, I don't know, an academic or whatever it may be. So we have all of those multiple roles we play in life. And I think we can act, we can sort of, if that makes sense, sort of activate them differently depending on what we want to do. And I think given that we are saying, you know, we're solar punks, we believe in this uh, vision and this framework, I think uh, works like anarchist modernity and ironically uh, works or at least the experience or the story of our opponents like those, uh, like the ones of uh, Milton Friedman uh, have a lot to inform us uh, going forward. And I did a TLDR, humans inhabit a pluriverse on this planet, one in which all living beings coexist in rhizomatic networks. Within such a framework, Solopon can very quickly go from politically impossible to politically inevitable. Again, reusing that, that quote. And I'll stop at that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joey. Next up, we've got Luca. Luca, do you want to um, just give a quick introduction, let everybody know where they can follow you, and uh, we'll jump right in. Hi, I'm Luca. I host the Solar Punk Now podcast, and I'm especially interested in ideology, technology, and culture. So our panel is themed around infrastructure, which we see not just as physical infrastructure, but also a more immaterial sense of like infrastructures of thought and action. So one example is capitalist realism, which is a constraint on thought, and it's also a psychological disposition, sort of this depressed feeling that no matter what we do, the world is falling apart. Solarpunk aims to challenge this, but it can only do so with a firm theoretical grounding. So when capitalism puts a constraint on the horizon of possibility, we need to recover the ability to see clearly before we can start to decide on what actions to take. Um, I think this is especially important uh, if we're trying to be actually truly radical and build something new. Otherwise, we run the risk of having our energies absorbed into projects that reform and exist, reform and strengthen existing institutions. So um, I think neoliberalism is best understood as the rationalization for contemporary capitalism. Part of its work is propping up this increasingly clunky and accident prone economic system, but there are also certain epistemological and ontological features of it that we've actually internalized. And we use them as tools for making sense of the world and like even understanding ourselves. So in the same way that a highway guides traffic, our habits of thought and action are guided by ideology. And these ideologies aren't just something external that we're struggling against, but they're like, they're internalized, they're constructive of our own subjectivities. For Foucault, neoliberalism isn't just a simple extension of classical economics, um, you know, the logics of exchange, commodities and consumption. Um, but in fact, he says the problem of neoliberalism was not how to cut out or contrive a free space of the market within an already given political society, but rather how the overall exercise of political power could be modeled on the principles of a market economy. To discover how far and to what extent the principles of a market economy can index a general art of government, neoliberals had to subject classical liberalism to a number of transformations. Neoliberalism is not just capitalism on steroids, but you know, it's, it's not just carving out more space for the market or, you know, extending the market's reach. It's actually a major conceptual development and the role of government and law are redefined. So the relationship between society and the economy, the individual's role within it, um, you know, we're not just strengthening the economic realm against the political realm, but actually redefining the whole political realm in economic terms. And this also redefines the roles of individuals or, um, you know, society is collapsed into individuals, like Margaret Thatcher would put it. Um, so neoliberal subjectivity, uh, the way it constructs us as subjects um, is, you know, neoliberal subjectivity. That's how we get the idea of ourselves as independent entrepreneurs who are constantly trying to increase their own human capital. For philosopher Byung Chul Han, um, he builds on Foucault to develop the psychological dimension of neoliberal, neoliberal subjectivity. 
<laughs> uh, which is called psychopolitics. And this is perhaps best summarized as a shift from external class struggle out in the world to this internal class struggle that's taking place in our own minds. On this new form of subjectivity, Han writes, today we do not deem ourselves subjugated subjects, but rather projects, always refashioning and reinventing ourselves. A sense of freedom attends this passing from the state of subject to that of project. But all the same, this projection amounts to a form of compulsion and constraint, indeed to a more efficient kind of subjectification and subjugation. So in a world of being your own boss or being your own project, self-discipline is really important, but the way we discipline ourselves mirrors how a manager would discipline their employees. So in trying to escape the nine to five, we're really internalizing and self-imposing these constraints that you find in the workplace. It's a new form of unfreedom that is even more insidious because we feel that we're free. This contradiction is, is confusing and it's really psychologically challenging. So Han goes on to argue that a lot of the anxiety and depression and burnout we feel can be traced back to this crisis of freedom and this internalization of discipline. Another aspect of psychopolitics is a hollowing out of the political realm. So because we're so caught up in managing ourselves and this class struggle is felt as something internal, we've lost the sense of we that's even necessary to see collective action as possible. I think um, collective action and even collectivity itself is a concept that we'll need to reconstitute as we work towards a solar punk future. Let's take another interpretation of the word infrastructure. Technology is at the forefront of our cultural imagination right now, um, and it's an important part of maintaining and extending neoliberal power, but it's also a really prominent feature of solar punk. And I think if we're going to liberate technology from its role in domination and exploitation, we need better theories. So let me show you what I mean. Tech determinism, uh, you may have heard the term tech determinism, which usually crops up when we talk about how social media or phones or something is like single-handedly destroying society. This is basically, there are lots of different iterations, but in general, the idea that technological advancement is what drives history and social change. Um, essentially because technology is a determining factor, it, it determines the structure of our social relations and our institutions. So, for example, a tech determinist might argue that the invention of agriculture is uh, what led to the formation of cities, or that smartphones are like the reason we're all so lonely and isolated. But tech determinism is reductionist because it ignores the design decisions that go into a technology, how and why the technology is produced, and the fact that people who use it or feel its effects still have agency. Social ecologist Kaya Heller writes, the truth is talking about technology is often an excuse for not talking about institutionalized power. It is often an excuse for not talking about the specific ways that institutions such as corporations and the state collude in shaping technologies that are socially and ecologically unjust. So with tech determinism, there's no discussion of the different actors who are involved besides the technology itself and some sort of amorphous, all-encompassing society that passively receives its effects. Social and political forces are a weak reaction to strong technological forces. So tech determinism tries to bypass politics, and I think for us as solar punks, it should be obvious that there's a problem there. Um, tech neutrality, another common pitfall we fall into when we're talking about technology, uh, or also known as tech relativism, I think this requires a little more discussion. This is the idea that technology is just a neutral tool which can be used in good or bad ways. And I think this is where some solar punks fall. We understand that technology is political, but only in the sense that it can be used for political aims. So a knife, for example, can be used to chop vegetables to feed your community, uh, or you can stab someone. <laughs> so tech relativism seems intuitive, but it's actually reductionist in its own way. We wind up with a social determinism instead of a technological determinism. And it means we can't talk about the politics of a technology in itself, which uh, maybe sounds a little strange, but it'll be clear with a few examples. So political theorist Langdon Winner argues that there are two ways in which a technology itself can be political or have political content. The first is when the design and features of a technology have distinct political effects. The features may be intentional or accidental, but either way, the technology becomes a political actor and becomes a way of settling a given issue in a community. Winner has us consider the overpasses on the Long Island Parkway in New York. 
Built around the first half of the 20th century by Robert Moses, the clearance under the overpasses is unusually low. Um, you may have seen like funny videos on the internet of people running into these and like the top of the truck comes off. Um, and I think a lot of people think this is just a design flaw, just sort of an accident. Um, but one important effect of these low overpasses is that when they were designed, the 12 foot tall public buses in New York couldn't fit under them. Um, only private cars could fit. And what this meant is that low income and black New Yorkers who were the main public transport users couldn't access the Long Island Parkway while white private car owners could. These bridges, which are finally in the process of getting replaced are not a neutral technology because they actually are a physical reinforcement of segregation. They keep the, the beaches and the parks on the Long Island Parkway effectively white only spaces. Um, and yeah, in this case, historians believe that the design was intentional. The second way in which a technology can be political, um, a great example is nuclear weapons. So Winner says, the atom bomb is an inherently political artifact. As long as it exists at all, its lethal properties demand that it be controlled by a centralized, rigidly hierarchical chain of command that's close to all influences that might make its workings unpredictable. The internal social system of the bomb must be authoritarian. There is no other way. So in this case, the technology all but demands a certain social arrangement, which in this case is a higher, uh, a rigid hierarchy with different levels of access and security clearances. Uh, and that's because the technology itself has a strong social and political momentum to it, which plays a major role in the formation of the network it's embedded in. So technology is not neutral. Um, it has structural biases that determine the relations around it and the ways it can be used, but the social conditions of the technology still matter. And even a well-intentioned technology needs to have social and political strength behind it. As an example, Kaya Heller writes, Organic fertilizer is structurally biased in a clear direction, albeit a positive one. It is constituted by the very intention underlying its design to enhance rather than deplete the composition of soil and water. However, while we might say the technology of organic fertilizer is not neutral, we could not say that the technology of organic fertilizer will actually determine that the world's soil and water will be enhanced. Rather, it is a set of social relationships that determines the scale by which agricultural workers will be able to apply organic fertilizer, as well as whether the soil and water will be too damaged by previous abuse. So here are both the technical specifications of the technology and the social relations it's embedded in are important. We couldn't say that organic fertilizer is neutral because you know it's designed to restore so soil health in non-destructive ways. It's structurally biased towards doing good in the world but it won't do any good sitting around in a warehouse. People need to be able to access it, put it in their gardens and farms um, for any of that potential good to be actualized. So the technology itself is not deterministic um, because it needs designers, users, and advocates, but it's also not neutral because it's easier for it to be used in positive ways. Even the most solar punk sounding technologies will be useless without solar punks who are ready to put them to work. Building a better world will be a joint effort, both inside laboratories, out on the streets, and in a democratic deliberation between those domains. Building the infrastructures of a better world includes immaterial infrastructures of thought and action. When we internalize the status quo hegemonic ideologies around us and apply them to ourselves and our everyday interactions with technologies, um, and even our larger institutions and policy decisions, we're taking these unrevolutionary thought infrastructures for granted. And this is putting constraints on both our theory as activists and our actions. So a successful solar punk project won't just take action, but will in tandem be developing and incorporating new ways of thinking that advance the horizon of possibility. Uh, and this is what makes true radical revolutionary action entirely realistic. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Luca. We'll move on with uh, Ariel. Ariel, do you want to introduce yourself um, and give it a little bit of information about you? Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name's Ariel. Um, I am an independent settler scholar um, with a PhD in English from the University of Alberta. Um, I come from studying science fiction, um, specifically older science fiction like cyberpunk. And so I'm really interested in how solar punk is emerging as a genre 
Uh, I'm also very interested in solar punk because of my own climate anxiety. So that's great. I've done a lot of thinking about it. So without further ado, let's uh, let's hop right in. All right, so we live in capitalism. We all both suffer from and prop up this system in what affect scholar Lauren Berlant calls a structure or a relationship of cruel optimism. That's when something that you desire is actually an obstacle to your flourishing. So the example is you want to work so you can eat or make rent or your mortgage payments or work on your hobbies and life goals, but the job that you get causes you extreme anxiety and depression to the point where you're suicidal, so you're kind of back at the start and you can't do any of those things. Um, so if I were to ask any of us here attending the conference today, what is the one thing that grieves you? I expect you would have a really hard time narrowing it down to just one thing, since we all live under the boot heel of late capitalist neoliberal policies, no matter what state or nation that we're located in. We all have intersecting identities, and we all live in a multitude of realities. So the way that I experience the world is very different from anyone else, and vice versa. Uh, part of what's so attractive to me, and I assume to most of us here, about solar punk is that it emphasizes doing what we can with what we have, where we're at, in the way that we're capable of doing it. Being alive at this time and where most of us are situated means that we're embedded in or beholden to state capitalism in some way. And that means that we're in a perfect situation to do something about it in a thoughtful and equitable manner. As feminist post and philosopher Rosie Brayotti puts it, we need to think multiply. The Anthropocene is a great big giant tangled knot of intersecting oppressions, and it's not just one thing that's harming us. Similarly, there's no silver bullet singular solution. I argue that while building a new world within and around the systems and structures of the old, however, solar punks have to be very careful not to unconsciously replicate the same modes of oppression that were baked into those old ways. The solar punk future focus is great, but we have to recognize that any future that we make is grounded in what we do in the present, which in turn is a product of our collective past, which we need to acknowledge and learn from if we want to move forward into a truly new social organization. So there's an episode of the Solar Punk Now podcast with Luca where Andre reminds us that social experiments are subject to the scientific process. So like any experiments, they're going to fail and they'll fail a lot and they'll fail hard but we need that failure to learn how to be successful. So queer theorist Jose Esteban Munoz argues that the failure of certain life ways and political systems is no reason to abandon them to history, actually. Munoz begins his book, Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer futurity with a discussion of a 1971 manifesto by a group calling itself Third World Gay Revolution which included a detailed list of 16 demands, including abolition of capital punishment, institutional religion, and the bourgeois family. It ended with a call for, quote, revolutionary socialist society, unquote, including, quote, free food, shelter, clothing, transportation, healthcare, utilities, education, and art for all, unquote. They, quote, want a society where the needs of people come first, unquote. So this society obviously has failed to materialize as yet. But Minos contends that there is, quote, great value in pulling these words from the no longer conscious to arm a critique of the present, unquote, as the we in the manifesto speaks to, quote, a, quote, logic of futurity, a we that is not yet conscious, the future society that's being invoked and addressed at the same moment, unquote. It's not a description of who the collective is in that moment, he argues, but rather it describes what the collective and the larger social order could be, what it should be. Minoas reads the failure of queer people to conform to heteronormative dictates as a kernel of utopian potentiality, writing that utopia's rejection of pragmatism is often associated with failure, and that queer utopia represents, quote, most profoundly, unquote, a failure to be normal. Similarly, Jack Halberstam in The Queer Art of Failure argues that failure can be a productive way of critiquing capitalism and heteronormativity and a way to explore alternatives to individualism and conformity. Renaud describes this idea of queer utopia as, quote, a backwards glance that enacts a future vision, unquote. By looking to the past, queer utopian dreamers see what can be redeemed, but also what can be avoided. 
the past is not a template, more of a loose collection of guidelines or like a mood board that provides inspiration and a target for solar punk hopes, which may well be disappointed at times by the events that transpire on the way to the future. But just because hope could be disappointed and is prone to it is not, Munoz writes, a reason to forsake it as a critical thought process. Disappointment needs to be risked in order to resist certain impasses, such as the despair that's induced by the slow moving but ever present threat of climate catastrophe, or the drudgery of late stage capitalism, the intensification of current political fascisms, or the inability to imagine and build a better future. Uh, likewise, Indigenous scholar Kim Talbear turns to the past with the purpose of envisioning an alternative decolonial future that avoids replicating the oppressive structures of the present. Talbear, who's Dakota, finds hope and what she terms a hostile joy in the, quote, implosion of the settler narrative, unquote, which assumed an inevitable failure of Indigenous societies in the, in the United States and Canada. When settlers first came to Northern Turtle Island, the narrative was very much that European society, religion, and culture in all aspects was superior, and that it was only right and natural for a settler colonial ways of life disrupt, supplant, and ultimately erase indigenous societies since they were quote unquote, failed ways of living that belonged to the past. And I encourage you all to Google salvage ethnography for a really educational and terrible time to get a sense of what I mean by this. I'm not gonna dedicate a slide to this, but suffice to say, generations of indigenous folks here in Northern Turtle Island were told again and again that they, both their whole cultures and themselves as individuals were failures and doomed to extinction for the simple fact of being born native. Talbear celebrates certain resurgences of the past, such as land reclamation and rediscovering of kinship and relational modalities that necessitate new arrangements, and infrastructures dictating our very thinking patterns about human relations with each other and specifically with non-human nature. For example, Talbert remembers that after floods in 1997 in Minnesota, the farms were transformed into wetlands and she does not see endings there, but instead the regeneration of the prairies returning to themselves. She does not celebrate the devastation of planetary ecosystems or harm to the most vulnerable humans and non-humans, but instead finds hope in quote, trusting in the collective genius of all the people who have survived these wicked systems, unquote. The future is as much about what is absent from our world as what is present, and solar punk thought should be deliberate and informed when considering inclusions and exclusions to creating the future in the present. So one last example comes from my thesis research into older science fiction, the genre of the first and second wave feminist utopia. This is what I would call a positive failure of a genre. These utopias are rooted in the kind of gender essentialism, eugenicist and anti-trans rhetoric that would make any contemporary feminist absolutely squirm. But they were a crucial intervention into a genre that up until the critical mass of second wave feminist writing and science fiction in the 1970s was, and sadly still is for the most part, extremely white male dominated, misogynist and was charting a future full of space age technology at the same time as depicting the same tired trope of the happy homemaker and the sexy young temptress, backwards social arrangements and all, just in space. Not to mention the stifling whiteness and cis heteronormativity of it all. The quote unquote radical feminist utopias of the 20th century were a breath of fresh air in this sense, since they imagined genuinely new social arrangements, creating an imaginative space beyond oppressive patriarchal structures. It was a start and definitely not a place to end up. But the use of failed ideas is that we can always critique them and in doing so, recuperate the parts that are valuable to the human experience and leave to history the bits that belong in the past. Munoz writes that the strategy of turning quote to the past for the purpose of critiquing the present is propelled by a desire for futurity, unquote. I think it rhymes very nicely with an ideal practice of solar punk thought. And I would put forward that any solar punk action to create new structures in the present, to do a bit of research into what's already been done, to learn from what's come before, to see what tools to pick up and which to leave to the compost pile of history. And on that note, take it away, Andre. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ariel. I'll move over to the work cited here. If anybody wants to uh, take a screenshot, learn, you know, a little bit deeper. Um, and gain some more knowledge. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.
All right, so I'll move on to um, my own presentation, um, Building a Better World. Um, I want to close out the presentations for today uh, by talking about the material reality that we're in right now, um, not just right now, but the future as well, right? Um, the material, speculative, and imaginative reality that Solarpunk as an idea is talking about. So starting from where we're at right now, imagining a better future, and taking steps to make that better future happen. So closing this panel out, I'm going to go into some detail on how we can do grassroots, small-scale organizing, and projects to help build mass movements. And kind of on the similar vein of what Andrew was talking about earlier, you know, these small movements snowball into mass movements, into collective change, right? How do we snowball all this together to build a better world within the shell of the old? Hey, everybody. My name is Andre, uh, but I use the handle Hydropodic Trash online. Uh, just like John Threat earlier, I am a hacker uh, to the solar punk pipeline, uh, writer and a gardener, uh, mainly focus on uh, appropriate technology and uh, permaculture. All right, so let's talk about the infrastructures of our lives, right? The socioeconomic systems around us really largely dictate how we live. Um, our, our lives underneath the surface have these infrastructures that keep things running, things in our lives that we actually need to live, and the things that make sure those things happen to and work. So think about the things in your life that under our current socioeconomic system require you to work a job, to earn a wage, to pay bills, and <laughs> pay for services just to survive. So typically, most people think of food, water, and shelter, but, you know, as we all know, that's just the bare minimum. And under the current socioeconomic system of neoliberal capitalism, uh, not everyone has access to nutritious food, clean water, and a place to live. All of this is dictated by if a person can afford it or not. So this really is the, you know, example of a society uh, in a world based off of scarcity and individualism, where even the basic necessities for life are gatekept to those who can afford it. But these aren't the only infrastructures that have an impact on our lives, right? So right now we're talking together through the internet, which requires electricity, right? We need to not get around to and from work, but not just work, but just to live our daily lives. So we also need transportation, right? We need the ability to communicate with others in this modern world. Um, and, you know, there's so much involved with this. There's so many real infrastructures of our lives just to stay alive, literally, like healthcare. Um, you know, I won't list all these points off, but you can kind of get the gist and understand that, like, there are major systems that have a direct material impact on our lives. These are the infrastructures that we're talking about. And climate collapse will affect all of these uh, to a major degree, right? The climate collapse will cause an immense amount of change to every single part of our lives. And it'll affect how we grow food to the scarcity of clean water, the destruction of homes from increasingly stronger natural disasters as the years go on. Uh, with those, we'll see impacts to our electrical grids, transportation, communication, all of it will be impacted by our changing climate. Our climate, keep in mind, that's being destroyed uh, by fossil fuels and the thought that we can have infinite economic growth on a finite planet. Related to this is the creeping threat of fascism taking hold across the world and the capitalist system kind of being put into overdrive to keep the economic systems always profiting, always running, and always extracting. And so we need to rethink, radically rethink how we operate and how we relate, we relate to each other and to the environment. And the question at the core of the issues at hand, right? 
we need to change that cycle of our social and economic systems and how they influence our infrastructures and in return, how our infrastructures influence our social and economic systems back, right? We need to imagine how do we adapt to a rapidly changing future while also taking the steps to make those changes happen. We need concrete political change, mass movements of people just saying enough. So kind of following the solar punk ethos, um, we'll, we'll look into the face of climate collapse, unjust hierarchies, violence, exploitation, racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. And we say, fuck that. And we look into the climate crisis and recognize it. We recognize the symptoms and the consequences. And despite all of it, we say that the ecosystem and humanity will adapt for the better. So we need to build autonomy through the concept of dual power and collective egalitarian and intersectional mass movements, right? We need food autonomy, bodily autonomy, water autonomy, land back to the indigenous people who this land was stolen from. Um, we need accessibility not as a default, not as an afterthought. We need it as the basis of all things. Clean water, free shelter, universal and free health care, urban planning and so much more. But what is dual power? Uh, the Black Socialists of America have this quote. Um, here's a source as well, if you want to scan and, and, and read that a little bit more. But they describe dual power as a situation where there's two powers, a democratic one developed by poor and working class people, defined usually by direct democracy, and the other one, capitalist, defined by domination coexisting and competing for le legitimacy during the transition away from capitalism. So we need to build the world that we want to see in the future right now together, despite all of it. And on the topic of being realistic, some of this seems like it might be out of reach, but all of this is possible, right? Dual power means all power to the people. And what we want to do as solar punks is challenge this notion of, of what the future is going to look like, challenge the ideas of what the future could look like and say, OK, this might seem like science fiction. This might seem, uh, you know, unreachable, but it is reachable. And here are, you know, different ways that we can get closer to that ideal, um, just like Luca was talking about earlier technologies aren't neutral. And so, you know, implementing a a whole host of specific technologies and thinking that it'll fix everything isn't the solution. It's combining the tools that technology gives us with social change to make that happen because our infrastructures influence our social and political structures, our social and political structures influence our infrastructures back. Okay, that all sounds awesome, but what does dual power actually look like? So like solar punk in general, um, let's speculate on an example. Back that up with uh, social and political theory and build the solutions to make that better world happen. So this is your apartment. Uh, you come home from a 12 hour shift making barely minimum wage for some mega corporation who makes billions of dollars a year. Food after a long day of work, eh. Not not very fresh. There's not even a grocery store nearby. The long days make your immune system drop and you don't start feeling well. Your hand is cramping to the point where you can barely move it most days, but you can't afford to see a doctor. But pretty soon you won't be able to even work. But you start talking to your neighbors, other people who work at the same company in town, your elderly neighbor who struggles to get up to her floor with her wheelchair and the broken elevator in your building. You all share food. It's nice to have a homemade meal, even though it's kind of a trek to a real grocery store. There's been talk from people within the building of them not being able to afford their rent anymore. And they were wondering, hey, if we band together, they can't evict everyone, right? A rent strike is being talked about, but social media platforms are often monitored for this type of thing. So you set up a small server 
that runs off of solar power to host books about growing food indoors, about organizing tenant unions, about guerrilla gardening. And that server also might host an encrypted chat where people in your building can talk safely about organizing. Your hands cramping from the repeated use at work, but it helps to stretch it out. It also helps when you go start planting wildflowers and edible veggies in a gorilla garden in a barren planter box downstairs. So more people start to get involved in generating their own power. Um, some people use solar panels. A wind turbine is set up on the roof in an apartment block to run the servers and charge your neighbor's electric wheelchair. Uh, passive solar water heaters go up as well to make hot water as long as the sun's out, along with sand batteries to keep the seedling warms during the cold winter nights. You start a small garden on the rooftop. The landlords are a huge corporation that never come by, so for now, things are safe, but that might change. Other people are starting to take notes from an old rundown apartment block with more green plants creeping in and the tiny libraries and free stores popping up on the block. So more people are joining in. Block after block is getting greener. There's community run kitchens and people sharing food to anyone who wants it. A large storm blows in with Climate change, storm seasons seem to be worse and worse. The grid power fails because the electrical companies didn't want to upgrade their equipment, but the community has been preparing for this. Uh, they generate their own power and make sure people can charge their medical devices and phones to stay connected to the community network, sharing information and resources and looking out for each other. So there's an intersectional movement forming, right? Being fostered by the mutual aid in the community. Free food, clean water, curbs get cut and made more accessible. Cars are replaced with bikes and public transit. Empty homes and apartments are squatted. Land is occupied and the stolen land is returned back to the indigenous people of the area. Those from indigenous backgrounds share their knowledge of the land and, and methods to help cultivate the local ecosystems. Agroforestry and permaculture become the standard as rural, suburban, and urban areas aren't divided anymore, but connected by mutual aid. These ideas spread past the entire region. People are organizing together. Circles are forming to take care of specific things. New insulated and natural homes are built where possible and existing homes are retrofitted. The state is crumbling, holding on to power as much as they can after the economic hit of people dropping out from their economic games. The police and fascist street groups try and stop the tide, but community defense groups stop them in their tracks. No one waited for a glorious revolution. They made it happen. So people did run, run for office and, and won and were able to change things at an, uh, at an institutional level. Uh, no one waited for the state to step in. They just took care of business together. Eventually, we got off of fossil fuels and learned how to downscale and adapt to less used appropriate technology instead of destructive high-tech solutions. We created an autonomous government of the people who are connected by their collective power, but also by their autonomy themselves. They used dual power to get there. They didn't wait, they got started. Even at incredibly small levels, these small projects, these small initiatives, these small uh, community-led uh, projects snowballed into larger community action and then eventually into collective action. Your apartment starts to feel cool in the summer with fast-growing hemp insulation. The street isn't full of cars, but people going about their day, sharing food, sharing laughs. You don't have to work that shitty job anymore, and you work only four hours a day at the local collective you volunteer for. Even though the storms are getting stronger and the climate's getting weirder, we're taking steps to bring back native and restorative ecosystems. We built a world based on mutual aid and mutual respect. <laughs>
And so in this speculative future, right, we changed our social and economic systems from scarcity, domination, violence, and exploitation to a system based on mutual aid, abundance, and symbiosis with the ecosystem. We built the new autonomous infrastructures and building that autonomy made revolutionary action happen even more. It made it easier for people to collectively act. It made it easier for uh, people to have access to all the things that they need to live happy and healthy lives. So you can see uh, that how our social and economic systems influenced the infrastructure of our lives and those infrastructures influenced those systems back. But as Andrew said earlier, uh, all power to the people. We can do all of this together right now.